What's up everyone, it's Ornlu, and it is time for our historical battles tier list. So I started working on my campaign tier list project, and then realized that the historical battles didn't really fit into the sorts of criteria I had in terms of judging my campaigns. So I decided, let's uh, dip our toes into this whole process by just doing a tier list for the historical battles, all 16 of them, eight Age of Conquerors battles, eight Forgotten battles, and, you know, these are still such an important part of the AoE2 campaign experience, and there are just a bunch of different scenarios, and I still think it would be fun just to go through them and grade them and sort of see how they stack up to one another and how they have their place within the whole AoE2 campaign experience. So our actual methodology is going to be quite similar to uh, my top five design scenarios video. So we're going to be looking at, okay, how well do they play? How unique are they? how engaging of an experience, are they easy, are they challenging, are they annoying, are they fun, that whole sort of thing. But we're also going to be looking at uh, their stories and how well the specific civilization that you play is showcased and how well that fits into any other campaigns that that civilization may have. So it's a bit broader and a little bit more looking at the big picture, I guess, compared to like just looking at the scenario design itself. Because when you're doing a historical battle, or I guess when you're making one, it's going to be a little bit trickier to actually set up any sort of, I guess, identity or experience because you don't have multiple scenarios that you can tell a story with. You have to, you know, tell a story and then finish the story and have unique identities for who you're playing, their motivations and all that stuff in a single scenario. So that is going to be a little bit tricky and that's, I guess, going to be the differentiating factor between these uh, historical battles and just the scenario tier list and all that stuff. So before I jump into our historical battles chronologically, I do just want to say that this video did take quite a while to put together, so I would really appreciate it if you enjoy it to leave a like down below. But without further ado, let's get into the tier list. Our first scenario chronologically is Bokhara 557. This historical battle is part of the forgotten half of the scenarios, and like most of them, was designed by Freeman 1302. Bokhara finally gives players an opportunity to play as the Persians, who, despite being an Age of Kings civilization, have never actually had their own campaign. The battle pits the Sassanid Persian Emperor Khosrau against the White Huns of Central Asia, as well as their northern neighbors in the Gok Turks. The main gimmick of this scenario is the paying off mechanism, whereby you can keep the White Huns from attacking you by occasionally tributing them some protection money. You can also choose to forge a temporary alliance with the Gulk Turks. This will give you time to build up your base from scratch, although you are encouraged to protect the Persian village from White Hunnic raids. Nevertheless, once you reach the Imperial Age, the scenario becomes a straightforward build and destroy mission, with your goal simply being to defeat the White Huns and the Gulk Turks. So, as your only chance to play as the Persians in all of the AoE2 DE campaigns, how well does Bokhara showcase the Persians as a civilization? I would say pretty darn well. By starting in the Castle Age, but having to build up your base from nothing, you get to experience the might that is the Persian eco, as you can use both fast working TCs and docks to jumpstart your economy. From there, you can develop a deadly army of as much Persian cavalry as you want, including the awesome War Elephants. The tribute mechanic, potential Gokturk alliance, as well as a couple of nice side quests give the scenario some great flavor and help distinguish it from the many other build and destroy scenarios out there. I do have one small complaint with this scenario, however, and that is how slow it is to end. You can spend a long time hunting down random units and buildings to destroy, but other than that small issue, this historical battle is one I would highly recommend. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to play the clip for you where I go over what the scenario was all about and I guess my critique of it from a design perspective. But this is still a tier list video, so we still need to actually place the scenario on the tier list. So that's what we're here for. Also, quick shout out to Folder of Doom for making this for me, uh, the tier list itself. But yes, let's go ahead and place Bokhara. So I do think that this is a really strong scenario overall. It's a great showcase of the Persian civilization. Like I said, it's all about booming and cavalrying, and it's got some fun mechanics with the tributes and stuff, but I don't think that there's really anything that gives it like a super incredible amount of like replayability or anything like that that would put it into S tier, and it is a little slow to end, and for that reason I am going to be putting this one into the A tier. Still a very strong first scenario here. Next up we have Dos Pilas, 648. Like Bokhara, this scenario was developed by Freeman as part of the Forgotten Historical Battles. 
Also like Volcara, Dos Pilos is your only chance in all of the AoE 2 DE campaigns to play as the Mayan civilization, who sadly never got their own campaign, and indeed only appear as some smaller villages in the Montezuma campaign. That said, this scenario is quite the expansive one, as you play as a small group of Mayan warriors that are caught in the middle of a conflict between the two powerful city-states of Tikal and Kalakmul. Although initially allied to Tikal, you will swiftly be overrun by Kalakmul, and are then given the choice of which city you want to side with. Depending on which side you choose, the scenario will play out a little bit differently, although your ultimate goal will be to destroy the wonder of the other city, both of which are gigantic post-imp mazes of towers and infinite unit spam production buildings. Now, I do like the idea of the whole choose-your-own-adventure aspect of Dos Pilos, but the scenario unfortunately falls a bit flat in its execution. Regardless of which side you pick, the scenario feels incredibly grindy, as you have very limited resources, are stuck on either one or two town centers, and are set against infinite waves of increasingly well-upgraded Mayan armies. The scenario also suffers from a narrative aspect, as there really isn't any time to develop unique identities for either of the two cities, and they honestly feel very similar. Also, it is somewhat vexing that neither city actually helps you once you ally with them. I do think Dos Pilos does have some redeeming qualities though, and it does encourage you to make good use of plumes and eagles, and there are some differences in which city you ally with, and that will slightly change how you want to play the scenario. These differences mainly come in the form of side quests that you can accomplish to either protect or destroy some of the other local villagers, and both Tikal and Kalakmul do train slightly different armies. Finally, I do have to give this scenario some credit in that it is actually quite challenging and probably one of the more difficult historical battles out there, and if you are a person like me who really enjoys having challenges, then this scenario does offer something in that regard as well. So with all of that said, where do we place Dos Pilos? So I think based on the, the fact that you do have a choice to make and it is, you know, it, it's a big important choice and it is a rather challenging scenario. I do think it saves it from being D tier, but I honestly don't think I can justify being higher than C tier as it's just really, really grindy and like any given Telltale game, your choices don't really matter in terms of how the scenario is going to play out. Also, Mayan's not the greatest siege in the world and having to go through like such huge, heavily fortified cities is, it's a little bit of a pain. But, you know, it's not the worst historical battle out there. And if you like a challenge, you know, go for it. Journeying now over to Europe, we arrive at our first original Age of Conqueror scenario with Tour, 732. You play as the Franks under Charles Martel and essentially pick up right where the Tariq ibn Ziyad campaign ended, as you must stop the onslaught of the Umayyad Berber armies that are sweeping across southern France. You make your stand in the city of Tours, whose three town centers you must defend for the entirety of the scenario. Tours itself is a large walled city to the north of the map, but is unfortunately only in the Feudal Age, whereas both of your enemies begin in Castle Age with large armies pillaging outlying farms. However, Charles Martel, who is a totally awesome hero unit by the way, and his reinforcements have arrived in the east of the map, where you begin with a healthy army of knights and throwing axemen. In addition to defending Tours, you must strike at the Moorish-held city of Poitiers to the south, where you must capture the enemy baggage train, i.e. six trade carts, and bring them back to Tours. However, if you lose even one of the trade carts, then you must go and defeat both of your enemies. So considering Tours as a historical battle, we know that Franks have a lot of representation throughout the AoE 2 campaigns, which means that to rank highly on my tier list, this scenario really has to go above and beyond to differentiate itself from the Joan of Arc campaign and the Hastings battle. And honestly, Tour does a pretty solid job of that. The enemy armies consist of mostly camels and light cav, so you're incentivized to utilize the Frankish infantry instead of their cavalry, which gets some bonus points for historical accuracy because that's how the Franks were able to win the battle. However, the tour scenario is far from perfect, as once you defeat the admittedly scary first wave of enemy units, the scenario becomes incredibly easy. Your walls and three town centers allow you to get up a large economy and army relatively quickly, and then it's a fairly straight march just towards the city of Poitiers where you can just go and grab the trade carts. Lastly, it must be admitted that this historical battle's overall gameplay mechanics are fairly generic. All right, so now to place Tour. I feel like Tour is honestly a solid B tier scenario. I think it's pretty middle of the pack. It is admittedly very easy, at least once you hold off that first wave of, uh, you know, Light Cavern, Knights, and all that stuff. But 
I like how it really incentivizes you to use the the throwing axeman like is on the uh, the unit icon thingy and halbs and all that stuff. So that's that's pretty nice. And of course, you do get the use the awesome Charles Martel hero, which is like a throwing axeman with a super fast attack speed, and that's all pretty fun. And I honestly think you know it's it's a solid B tier scenario. It at least differentiates itself from Joan of Arc and has a fairly you know fun, if not rather straightforward, experience in my opinion. For our next scenario, we journey northward to the British Isles with the forgotten historical battle of York, 865. This truly gargantuan scenario was developed by Hockey Sam and has you go from only having a few Viking raiders to sacking pretty much the entirety of Britain and Ireland, making it the only scenario in the entire game to take place on a ludicrous sized map. Before you can do anything else, you must first find a place to set up your camp, which, considering the map size, is a process that can take up to 10 in-game minutes, and then you need to build your town and economy while you wait for the arrival of the rest of the Viking army. 15 minutes later, the army will arrive and consist of a bunch of elite longboats. From there, you are given several different options for objectives and how you want to go about completing the scenario. You can destroy the Wonder of York and then build one of your own in its place, gather a measly 50,000 gold, collect but only 15 relics, or lastly defeat only five of your seven enemies. Good luck! So let's be honest, this scenario has a lot of issues. I get the whole big epic Viking battle across Britain idea, and I'm not saying that the scenario does not give you that vibe, but it's honestly just too much. I've literally never done any objective in this scenario other than the build the wonder one, because one, it's the easiest by far, and two, if the game lasts for more than an hour, my computer's frame rate drops to about three. And I have a pretty good computer. So yeah, no matter how awesome it feels to tear through villages and cities with berserks, longboats, and rams, the scenario will always fundamentally be the next best thing to unplayable due to its way too bloated scale, and that just hinders the overall playability of the scenario so, so much. Alright, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone that I don't think the greatest of this scenario, and yes, I am going to put it in D tier. Unfortunately, uh, it, it's just too much, and it makes your game lag, and the fact that one of your options is like a quarter of the time of the other ones just really incentivizes you to do that one, and... Yeah, I just, I feel like this is something that probably should have been done on a little bit smaller scale. Like, you can do scenarios that are on, like, a giant map size, and that can be totally fine. It's just, the, the ludicrous sized one was, is too much. I mean, you had Hunflo Glalosh, like the old one, that was on a ludicrous map size, and that scenario was too much. So, kind of a similar deal with this one, in my opinion. It's just... Yeah, it's it's not, I think, the uh, the greatest uh, of battles ever. I mean, it's not completely, you know, hopeless. I mean, the, the ambiance is totally there. It's just, yeah, like I said, way too much. Okay, so our next two scenarios are ones that may be familiar if you watched my top five best design scenarios video. Link for that will be in the description. And they are Hanfla Glalash 895 and Vinland Saga 1000. Obviously, I have already talked about these two scenarios at length in that video, so I'm only going to briefly recap them here, and I think it's going to be pretty obvious that I will be placing both of them in S tier. So first, Hanfal Glalash is the one Magyar scenario in the game and was designed by Freeman, and it features incredibly unique gameplay mechanics where you can choose to be nomadic or sedentary, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. Then you must go and defeat two of the three surrounding enemies, and it's honestly just an incredibly fun, challenging, and unique scenario with so many different ways to play it. Vinland Saga, meanwhile, just exudes adventure, as Eric the Red and the Vikings must go from Iceland to Britain to Greenland to the Americas, all whilst avoiding the Sea of Worms, which will eat through the hulls of your longboats. For an AOC scenario, it's actually fairly challenging, as the lack of gold forces you to think about your army in a little bit of a different way, and the scenario even features a few fun easter eggs, i.e. me, and some other ones, I guess. Like Hunflo Glalash, it's just such a fun and unique, memorable experience, and because both are just historical battles, they're two scenarios I would highly recommend to anybody wanting to sort of dip their toes into the rather daunting amount of campaign content that's in the game now. Alright, so obviously... 
these two are both going to be an S tier, like I said. I'm not going to lie to you or like, oh, fake hype. Now, I will say that they're not the only S tier entries on this tier list, so they, they will have at least one friendo. But yeah, these two, obviously two of the very, very best scenarios in the game, would highly recommend them to anybody. And I guess this is a good time to point out that as far as like the tier list ordering itself, I'm just going like totally in chronological order. And yes, in my top five scenarios video, I had Vinland Saga at one and Hanfla Glalash at two, but you could make arguments, you know, any way you want. And I don't really feel like parsing them even more within the tiers. So yeah. So yeah, these two scenarios uh, just happen to be next to each other uh, chronologically. So I could just do it, you know, like a twofer, but both super duper good and would recommend, like I said. Returning to scenarios that I have not yet discussed, we next go to Hastings 1066, an AOC Battle of the Conquerors, and yet another scenario where you play as the Franks. The setup for this scenario is quite simple. You are William the Conqueror and have a small fortress in Normandy, and must build up your forces there before crossing the English Channel to launch your invasion of Harold the Saxon's castle in London. This castle is very well protected, but with some Frankish paladins and even some Viking allies, it's not an especially difficult task. So about Hastings, it's another Frank scenario, even though you play as the Normans aka Sicilians, which is pretty awkward because the Sicilian Civ are locked behind a DLC, whereas Hastings is base game content, so even though every other appearance of Normans in the game are now replaced by Sicilians, you're still playing as the Franks. Leaving all of that aside, however, and to be totally honest, I find this scenario to be incredibly underwhelming. You have a very simple and generic task, and the army composition you want to go for is pretty much exactly the same you would want to go for in Joan of Arc, i.e. a bunch of cavalry and some siege. And you don't even end up using a whole lot of the map because you don't actually need to go after the Saxon raiders in the south, or you don't need to go after the Saxon navy which has a big fortress to the west, you just completely circumvent it, as well as most of even Harold the Saxon's town itself. It just feels like Hastings doesn't really add much in terms of gameplay or experience. You can get the support of Harold Hadrada, even though Harold himself is an awesome hero unit, he and his berserks are stuck up in Norway, and you need to transport them across to England yourself. This means that the Vikings will frequently eat up a ton of your available pop space without actually being useful, and is overall a little bit annoying. And lastly, the scenario is also very, very easy, as you're just given tons and tons of time and space to get to whatever army you want, and then you can just go right to the enemy castle. So yeah, all in all, not the biggest fan of Hastings. I know it might seem pretty harsh, but I am going to put it in D tier. I might put it in C tier if Joan of Arc hadn't existed or like any Frank campaign exists. But, you know, Joan of Arc is, is like the classic Frank campaign. You're making paladins, siege units, so maybe a couple throwing axe, but mostly focusing on those uh, Frank cavalry and cheap castles and stuff like that. And I just... Hastings doesn't really seem to add much, and you don't even end up fighting the main bases of your opponents, like I said. So, yeah, honestly, I'm afraid I'm going to have to put it in D tier, just not because the scenario is, like, horrible to play. I mean, it's not that great. It's just kind of generic. It just doesn't feel like it adds anything to the game. So that's a little unfortunate for Hastings, but alas, it shall be joining York in the D tier. Speaking of fun and interactive experiences, we now turn to Anatolia and the Seljuk Turks with Manzikert 1076. Set before the introduction of firearms, the Turks must rely on their swift and tanky cavalry units to take down the various Byzantine themes, as well as the Byzantine army itself. You begin in Castle Age with a fairly large force, a decent amount of resources, a small but fortified camp, and no villagers. To get additional resources, you must capture the three aforementioned Byzantine themes by sending a unit to their town center. This may seem simple, but the Byzantines have constructed numerous defenses to keep you out. However, once you take all of the themes, you will advance to the Imperial Age and get some sort of reliable-ish income, and at that point you simply need to defeat the Byzantine army that is camped to the east, and then you win the scenario. So man's occurred. Okay, hear me out. It's not that bad of a scenario. So long as you play it on times 4 speed. That way you aren't waiting around all day and the experience becomes somewhat enjoyable. 
but yeah, the problem of this scenario lies in the fact that you are completely reliant on tributes from your allies for resource income, which leads to a large portion of the scenario spent simply waiting around. Also, the Byzantine theme of Galatia, which is the yellow player in the north, uh, is particularly annoying to crack because you have to use rams to knock down a gate that's right in between two castles. All in all, not a remotely fun experience. Still though, with your very limited resources and lack of gunpowder, you are encouraged to use Turk cavalry archers against the Byzantines once you have everything set up, and that is, I think, a pretty good showcase of how good Turk cav archers are, and, you know, it, it gives some sort of redeeming quality. Ultimately though, you end up with a scenario that is more frustrating than it is challenging or fun, which isn't really a great sign. Alrighty, so Manzikert, yeah, tic-tac-toe. 3D tiers almost in a row. I promise I'm not that salty towards the historical battles. I actually do like most of them, but yeah, this one, the fact that you have to play it on times four speed for most of the time to make it even like remotely engaging is not really the greatest. I just don't think that the whole waiting for your allies to tribute you resources mechanic translates too well in AoE2 campaigns, but that maybe that's just my opinion. Maybe you guys like this scenario, of course. It's all just my opinion, man, but yeah, this is, it's pretty painful. Also, like, Galatia is so annoying to attack, and also the randomly disappearing Byzantine armies are kind of goofy, but regardless, that's Manzikert, unfortunately, is going to go down into the D tier as well. On to more positive topics, we next journey east to Japan for the first of our two battles here, first with Kurikara 1183. This scenario was designed by Haki Sam, and is one of the only two times you get to play as the Japanese in all of the campaigns. Like York, this is another large-scale build-and-destroy scenario, as you can reach the Imperial Age in 200 pop, and have to take down the Tyra clan in Kyoto. However, unlike York, Kurikara is much more manageable in scale. You must first take command of the heavily fortified city of Kurikara, which stands more or less alone in a countryside filled with enemy armies and patrols. First, you must defeat the easier Castle Age Tyra army by slaying their commanders, and then must assault the extremely well-defended post-imp city of Kyoto. Also, once you get to Kyoto, Minamoto himself will show up with a bunch of mounted samurai to help you storm the city. So, Kurikara can be compared in many ways to its later Japanese counterpart, Kyoto. And yes, it is confusing because both scenarios involve you sieging Kyoto, but one of them is called Kyoto and one of them isn't, but all that aside, uh, that will be discussed more later. Uh, for now, it's just worth saying that this is a very solid scenario, and gives you a nice power trip using the best units that Japanese have available. A bunch of samurai, kataparuto trebs, and yasuma keeps. Once Minamoto himself arrives, it's kind of funny though, because the mounted samurai units are essentially just re-statted, renamed hussars, and are, you know, they're really strong cavalry units, but Minamoto himself is actually a fairly underwhelming hero unit, but that's kind of goofy, but neither here nor there, it's still pretty fun. And that kind of speaks to Kurikara as a whole. It's a pretty fun scenario, uh, but it's fairly straightforward and not, you know, too complicated or too flashy, but just a good, solid historical battle. So yeah, I am recording these segments now in a later time of the day from the earlier segments, so that's why the lighting's different. But anyway, Kurikara. Like I said, it's a good, solid scenario, and for that reason, I will be putting it in B tier. It's not very difficult. Uh, even if you have like a, a fairly like grand scale, you just get a ton of resources. Uh, you even have a bunch of techs researched for you, and the enemy isn't very aggressive. Uh, but it's still a pretty fun power trip with a bunch of elite samurai and Kataburuto trebs just chewing through buildings. And then you have your Yasuma keeps bombarding at everything that stands in your path. Uh, I would just say it's a good solid build and destroy scenario. Uh, the thing is, the, the Japanese... It's like a full Japanese mirror, right? So you only have like Castle Age Japanese units, and then you just go attack the Imperial Age Japanese units. So that's kind of like, eh. But honestly, it's still a good, decent scenario. And it's definitely, you know, one I would say that is worth playing. Now we return to Europe as we embark on the Third Crusade with Richard the Lionheart in Cyprus 1191. This is the sole Bassi historical battle, and prior to the Edward Longshanks campaign was only one of two scenarios where you could play as the Britons, and this is the only one where you could actually build a base and train units. 
You begin with a scattered navy off the coast of Cyprus in the Imperial Age, and must quickly locate the rest of your forces before you take the city of Limassol in the east of the map. This will give you an actual base to work with, so that you can then take the fight to the enemy capital of Nicosia, which is a huge fortress in the far north of the map. Also, you have the potential to destroy the Cypriot Navy's fortress in the west of the map for a bunch of extra gold. Otherwise, this is a fairly straightforward build and destroy scenario with pretty limited resources and a relatively short distance to traverse before you get to the enemy. So how well does Cyprus showcase the Britons as a civilization? Uh, it's okay, and does a good job of incentivizing the use of your very powerful archers and trebuchets. However, the scenario fundamentally suffers from simply not being very fun. You have very little gold and stone to mine, and must face the classic infinite unit spam of Imperial Age Byzantine enemy units. And since Britons are a pretty slow civilization to begin with when it comes to taking down enemy bases, you're up against, well, a ton of towers and walls and castles, and they're all Byzantines and have a ton of extra HP and all that, and the whole scenario just feels like a bit of a grind fest. Concerning the scenario's difficulty, I'd say it's somewhere towards the middle of the pack as well, as it's not that hard, but you do have to be pretty careful with your resource management, and you do have to make sure you can keep your expensive gold units alive as well, but still, you're just uh, taking good trades and then pushing through the enemy base. Nothing too, too crazy. So before I play Cyprus, I just want to mention, because I forgot to do it in the recording, is that, yes, this is the only Bassi design scenario in the... Uh, historical battles, uh, but Bassi and Freeman both did the uh, the remasters, I guess, of the Age of Conquerors battles, and they split them with Bassi doing the first four Age of Conquerors battles historically, and Freeman doing the second half of the Age of Conquerors battles chronologically. Yeah. Anyway, Cyprus, it's a scenario that it's like, it's fine. It's fine. I wouldn't say it's that fun. I, I feel like it's a little grindy. You have a little too little gold and stone for my taste, and like the, the Cypriot Navy is like bombarding you from uh, the shoreline, but you don't really want to invest in a navy. Uh, destroying the enemy fortress helps a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's just a little bit of a grind fest for my taste. So I will be placing it in C tier. Um, it's one of those scenarios that if you you know, like that sort of thing, if you like just making sure you have to take efficient unit trades, then yeah, go by all means play Cyprus. It, it encourages you to play Britons fairly well, even mixing in light cav for like some mobility and siege sniping and stuff. But if that's not your thing, it's a, a scenario that I would say is okay to pass up. Next up, we travel a bit further north to Anatolia as we now join Osman and the rise of the Ottomans in the Battle of Bephaeus, 1302. This expansive scenario by Freeman is a real tour de force showcase of the Turk civilization, as you begin with only a small castle age town in the center of the map and are pretty much surrounded by hostile factions. You have three rival Turk factions with which to contend, as well as your ultimate target in the Byzantines, and even some Catalan mercenaries eventually show up to join in the fun! Although it may appear a straightforward build and destroy the enemy castle scenario, there are some interesting gameplay twists that give it a fair amount of replayability. You have the option to ally with one of the other Turkish factions, with each having their own strengths and weaknesses. Additionally, you can go it alone and take down everybody and will get some free techs for your boldness. You're not completely alone, however. As I just said, you can ally with one of the Turkish factions, and each really does a good job of having their own very unique identity, and this is further showcased by the fact that you get techs based on which ally you pick. So if you go for the more coastal ally in the west, you will get a bunch of naval techs. If you go for the more nomadic ally to the south of the map, you'll get a bunch of cavalry archer techs. And if you align yourself with the easternmost Turkish faction, you will get a bunch of fortification and defensive upgrades as they are behind a bunch of fortified walls themselves. Also, throughout the entire scenario, you'll be getting some reinforcements, occasionally from the east of the map. This will come in the form of just small groups of units, some villagers, some monks, cav archers, even a few mamelukes, all that sort of stuff. Now, considering Vefeus as a whole, I honestly think this scenario is absolutely fantastic, and only missed my top 5 list because I thought that Hamphloglalash was just a little bit more creative. That said, Vefeus is awesome because there are so many different ways you can play it, and you can choose which style of Turks you wish to focus on. Cav and Cav Archers, Gunpowder, Heavy Cavalry and Defenses, Navy, whatever you want. Also, I think Freeman did a great job giving each enemy a very distinct feel, 
as each enemy trains pretty different armies from one another, and each, like I said, have their own strengths and weaknesses. And lastly, it is a reasonably challenging scenario, you know, not one of the hardest ones out there, but still I think a pretty fun challenge, especially when it comes to having to multitask from being attacked from every different side at the same time. So as I suggested earlier, I really, really like Buffeus and do think it is actually worthy of S tier alongside Hanfal Glalash and Vinland Saga. Like I've been saying, it's just there are several different ways to play the scenario, giving it some, I think, much needed replayability factor, uh, especially for it being a build and destroy scenario, no, something that really uh, distinguishes it. And then you also have, I think, the Byzantines who are a tough but not like spammy, spam, spam level of you know, opponent to defeat. You have the Catalan Company, which can kind of throw a wrench into things, and there's just lots of different ways to play with all the different factions, like I've been talking about. Just a really good scenario, and one I would 100% recommend to anybody who is getting into the AoE2 campaigns. So yeah, Befeus going to be joining the likes of Hanful Glalach and Vainland Saga in that S tier. We now turn to our final forgotten battle, and that is Lake Poyang 1363. This Freeman scenario is the game's sole opportunity to play as the Chinese in a campaign, and depicts a battle between the rising Ming faction versus the Han faction for control over the crumbling Yuan dynasty. As the name suggests, this is a naval scenario where your goal is to safely escort shipments of materials across the lake to the city of Nanchang, where you must build the Temple of Heaven to win the scenario. Let's ignore the fact that the actual Temple of Heaven was built some 80 years later and hundreds of kilometers away in modern-day Beijing. Regardless, you first have to sail up the river to clear out the defenses of the Han Navy for your first shipment, and once that arrives, you will take control of the formidable Imperial Age city of Nanchang. From there, you must safely escort the other four shipments to the temple complex, all of which arrive from different locations and are guarded by enemy fortifications. Once all the materials have arrived, you can build the temple and finally win the scenario. So yeah, this scenario. Firstly, I do think it's kind of weird that your one chance to play as the Chinese is a naval battle, and you barely get to use Chuko Nu because of it. Therefore, I do think it falls a bit flat as a showcase for the Chinese civilization compared to the many other historical battles which feature civs that don't have campaigns. That said, you do get to use the Dragon Ship, which is a campaign-only fire ship variant, and those are pretty fun. Also, this scenario is incredibly long, taking well over an hour game time to complete at minimum, and is also very, very challenging. You cannot even go on the offensive too effectively because the Han Navy has some super OP towers guarding their fortifications with like a bunch of extra attack and range and they have heated shot and yeah, just don't bother with that. But all that said, the shipment defense concept is a pretty unique challenge and is a fun opportunity to use lots of those dragon ships. And if you don't mind a lengthy slog on water, Lake Poyang is definitely not an awful scenario. And this could just be my bias towards tricky scenarios, but I certainly don't mind playing it, to be honest. Okay, so now when it comes to placing Lake Poyang compared to all of the other historical battles, we're gonna do B tier, and that might be a little controversial. I feel like a lot of people would probably put it in C tier, maybe. But, you know, in playing back through it, I, I don't mind it. It's it's long, it's challenging. There's a little bit of, like, waiting involved in terms of, like, you're just kind of waiting around for the next shipment. But the fact that you're constantly under pressure means that it doesn't feel like you're just, like, Manzikert level waiting around. And... There aren't that many naval scenarios in the game, and there are very few naval defense scenarios. So I, I think that Lake Poyang does feel pretty unique. The dragon ships are pretty fun. And yeah, I, I don't think it's anything higher than B tier for sure. But I, I think it's honestly a, a reasonable entry into the B tier. Now we're in the home stretch, guys, 75% of the way done, as we just have four final battles of the Conquerors to sort through, as now we jump back to France for our second Britain scenario, that is Agincourt 1415. This scenario has you playing as Henry V in the early days of the 100 Years' War, after a failed siege of the city of Harfleur. Henry and his army must retreat back to England. However, to get to the docks at Calais, you have to fight your way through the French countryside. This is another fixed force scenario as you receive pretty much no reinforcements of any kind, and must rely on your starting army of various Imperial Age Britain units. To get to Calais, you must pass through a few French towns where there are some side quests for you to potentially complete, but then you eventually journey north towards Agincourt, where you get some nice Shakespeare quotes and a big showdown with the French knights. 
after defeating the heavy cavalry of the French, and it's only a short march from there to the docks for jolly old England. So Agincourt has a bit of a reputation in the community for a couple reasons. First, the scenario is actually, like, really incredibly easy, as you can just click Henry V to the other side of the map where the transports are, and you can win without fighting a single enemy unit, because he'll just run past everybody and just tank all of their damage. Also, you used to be able to convert some villagers and build a town of your own, although those sneaky devs no longer let you do that in DE. All of that said, there really isn't too much to the scenario other than some nice flavor and some nice identity and all that stuff. The side quests can get you some nice units that are fully upgraded, but aren't completely necessary, and it's a pretty straightforward point A to point B mission. Oh, Agincourt. So full of flavor. So not full of challenge. Or really a whole lot going on at all. I, I do think that it's still memorable enough of a scenario to get into C tier. Um, it's just, there there really isn't that much of the scenario. Like I said, it's you go from point A to point B, you can literally run King Henry there. Uh, and even if you play the scenario properly, it is very, very short and simple. Uh, but still, you get to use a bunch of longbowmen and get to go up the muddy hill and go through the dense forest and all of that stuff. Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare all that. So yeah, I do think a, a C tier placement is fair for this scenario because I'm sure a lot of people have fond memories of playing this as a kid and maybe appreciate the references uh, as you grew older like I did. So C tier for Agincourt it shall be. Next we return to the Ottomans but are this time playing as the Holy League and are attempting to stop the advance of the Ottoman fleet in the Battle of Lepanto 1571. Playing as the Spanish, you begin in the Imperial Age with a sizable coastal city wherein you must construct and defend a wonder that is built very close to the shoreline. A short skip across the tiny bay that makes up the majority of the map is the Ottoman fleet, an absolutely massive post-Imperial Turkish navy and land army comprising pretty much every decent unit that the Turks have in their tech tree. Their base is also absolutely riddled with castles and bombard towers, making aggression a rather daunting challenge. You can purchase the help of the local Greek village that is near your city, however, and they will provide you an excellent return on investment in giving you resources, as well as areas that you can safely mine gold and stone. Now with all of that set up, the rest of the scenario is a very straightforward defense mission, as you just have to survive the constant attacks of the Turks until the Wonder Timer counts down, and then of course you will win the scenario. So although a Spanish campaign exists in El Cid, Lepanto is a much more imperial, gunpowder, naval-focused scenario that feels quite different from what you encounter most of the time in El Cid, making it feel unique enough from that perspective, at least in my eyes. Indeed, the scenario can be very challenging if you play the intended defensive strategy, as the Turks will come at you from pretty much every angle with post-imp warships and transports full of soldiers. However, in this scenario, you have access to the powerful Spanish Cannon Galleon, so if you're able to take down the Turkish navy at sea, you can actually pin their entire flotilla in their harbor as you shell away at their defenses, making the scenario relatively easy. It's one of those cases of offense is the best defense, and in this case, that offense pretty much just means uh, kill all of the enemy transport ships, and then you don't have to worry about them anymore. Oh, Lepanto, the deceptively easy scenario. I feel like I have to have blown the mind of at least one person watching this video uh, with how the fact that you can just, you know, go on the offensive and just kill the Turks before your wonder timer even counts down. Uh, but of course, I did the same thing on my own playthrough of this for YouTube. But regardless, um, I like Lepanto. I think it's a, it's a fun scenario. Uh, not too many, like, wonder defense scenarios in the game, so... Uh, and this is the only, like, naval wonder defense scenario. So there, it has that, like, unique aspect. And it does have the fun gameplay of shelling stuff with Spanish cannon galleons, which is pretty great. But I'm going to have to put it in B tier because, of course, once you figure it out, the scenario is actually quite simple. And even after all of that, the scenario is pretty short. So that is a little unfortunate. Uh, but overall, I think it's a, it's a pretty decent scenario. Again, it's it's one of those solid B tier scenarios in my view. Just a good Age of Empires 2 scenario. I would definitely recommend it. 
it's uh, it's at least worth uh, blowing a bunch of stuff up on the water, right? Our last two scenarios chronologically bring us back to East Asia at the end of the 1500s. The first of those two, of course, being Kyoto 1582. This is the twin battle of Kurikara, but with a bit of a different focus. You begin by witnessing the execution of your master Oda Nobunaga and must exact swift revenge against the rebels in Kyoto by destroying the city's three castles. However, you must first conquer a base of operations, which leads you to the city of Osaka to the south of the map. When taking Osaka, you will discover four bombard cannons, units so important that it is the actual icon for the battle in the game, which is somewhat weird considering that the Japanese don't actually get bombard cannons in regular play. But, of course, the four you get in Osaka will help you out immensely throughout the entire scenario, so I can see it as a worthy pick. Before taking the fight across the river to Kyoto, you may want to destroy the nearby town of Hyogo, which could otherwise be a bit of a thorn in your side. Don't tarry too long though, as the Kyoto rebels will gather all of the relics and start a victory countdown before too long, so get those trebs and cannon galleons ready. Overall, Kyoto is a very strong scenario in my opinion, ranging from solid gameplay to an incredible ambiance and experience. Witnessing Nobunaga's execution and then storming Osaka was very well done as an introduction to the scenario, and Hyogo represents a nice sort of optional side quest. The relic timer does give you an interesting challenge, and the fact that you must cross the water to get to Kyoto itself means that, unlike Kurikara, you are forced to use the powerful Japanese navy. Aside from that, the scenario is pretty straightforward, as then you just simply have to take down the enemy castles. And if I do have a criticism with Kyoto, it's that you don't actually have to go very far into the city itself to take down those castles, meaning you can simply snipe them without really having to fight the main enemy itself. Oh, Kyoto, the only scenario where you get to have a, the whole thing centered around a unit that you can't regularly get, that isn't also a scenario editor unit. I, I'll see you, Lake Poyang! But uh, honestly, I do think this is a very strong scenario and a worthy A-tier pick, in my opinion. Small criticisms with, of how you don't actually need to go that far into Kyoto aside. Just the ambiance in this scenario is just fantastic, and the overall gameplay is solid. I like the Relic Countdown timer introduction thing. It does force you to get going across the water, which is something that, say, Hastings does not do. Because, like, in Hastings, you can just wait all day until you have a bajillion resources and whatnot. And they're like, Kyoto, yeah, I gotta get going, going. And you got the nice little side quest of Hyogo as well. And, yeah, overall, Kyoto, solid A-tier scenario, in my opinion. Now we arrive at our last, but certainly not least, historical battle with Noryang Point, 1598. This scenario is the only opportunity you have in all of the campaigns to play as the Koreans, and indeed the only time the civilization shows up in any campaign whatsoever. The scenario itself relives the famous battle at the end of the Imjin War between Korea and Japan, and your goal is to defend Korea from the Japanese until you can find Admiral Yi Sun Shin and his turtle ships. In DE, they also made defending Korea's wonder a much more integral part of the scenario, as keeping it alive will grant you a small trickle of resources and 10 more maximum population space. However, once Admiral Yi arrives to help you out, you can then take the fight across the sea that shall not be named to Japan itself. Once you destroy all of their docks, you secure Korea from future Japanese invasions and win your final historical battle. So, as somebody who studies Korean history as the main focus of my university degree, I must confess that I am certainly going to be biased when I say that I love this scenario. Rampant historical inaccuracies aside, Noryang Point is just filled to the gunnels with flavor and does everything it can to showcase the Korean civilization. In defending Korea, you must make good use of the Korean defenses, particularly their excellent towers, all the while working to secure the peninsula from the Japanese raiders. Once you find Yi Sun Chin, you get to utilize the awesome power of turtle ships, when they're not bugged, which they were bugged when I recorded the background footage for this, so whoops! But that is perfect considering that this was indeed the battle that turtle ships were actually used historically, and indeed Yi Sun Shin is actually one of the most revered figures in all of Korean history. The support of the Chinese is also an interesting addition, as although it can be quite helpful, the fact that you have to transport them across yourself means that they will often put you over pop cap. But still, you do get a bunch of Chukunu and Bombard cannons, so you can't really complain too much and are definitely a bit more helpful than the Vikings you get in Hastings. The biggest critique I have with this scenario is that once you do get Admiral Yi and have everything set up to take the fight to Japan, the Japanese Navy doesn't really put up much of a fight as you can win the water really easily and just shell away at the docks at that point. 
So, Noryang Point, our final historical battle. A personal favorite of mine, but if I am looking at things objectively, I will be placing it in A tier. I do think that it's very much worthy of the spot. It's just an excellent showcase of the Korean civilization, their strengths, the, I guess, applications for turtle ships and towers and archers as well as you're uh, taking the fight on the Korean mainland. It's just a really good scenario, and like I said, just absolutely filled with flavor. I really like the additions they had in DE. I think that actually really helped the scenario, giving you a bit more to do in defending Korea early on as the wonder gives you that extra pop space and trickle of resources. So I do think that is definitely a big boost for this scenario. But overall, definitely going to be an A tier, and I think a very memorable scenario, if especially like me, you are a Korean history nerd. Anyway, guys, that is it. We've completed all 16 historical battles for our AoE 2 DE historical battles tier list. We have a very, very balanced tier list. Before recording, I had all of my uh, placements figured out, but like when I was actually making the placements, it all kind of incidentally ended up in an almost perfect... Well, actually, it is kind of perfect because, you know, the one that has the most is in the middle. But all that aside, we've got Hanfoglalash, Vinland Saga, and Buffeus in S tier. Bokura, Kyoto, Noryang, A tier. Tour, Kurikara, Lake Poyang, and Lepanto in B tier. Dos Pilas, Cyprus, and Agincourt in C tier. And then finally, York, Hastings, and Manzikert, alas, in the D tier. So, yeah, this has obviously been quite the video. It's been insanely long to record and edit and do all that stuff, so I really, really hope you guys enjoyed it. I did want this to be a pretty special video, so please leave a like if you enjoyed, comment if you, uh, want to tell what your favorite historical battles were and all that good stuff. So this is what I plan on doing for my campaign tier list, although I think that this shows that this is going to need to be a, a multi-video process because, yeah, this is already super long. But again, hope you guys enjoyed watching, and I will see you all next time.